tell you folks, um, just setting up the CAD. It'll be a sec. How's everyone doing on this Wednesday, the 9th of December? Hmm. Let's have a look at the kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, bench. Uh, off the moment. We need, don't need that. Hope my audio levels are good, by the way. Uh, let's get the schematic up. And, oh, no, that's not right. Uh, it's picked up the wrong window. Hold on. Uh, Yeah. Hold on, it's made this all twisted, man. You twisted my melon. What's going on here? Circuit. Okay. Now yeah, let's just bring the PCB up. And. Some reason that is stretching it. Let me see if we can make this a bit less stretched. Okay. Um, right, so. Uh, Let's just do the community bits and pieces first and then I'll switch over to CAD. I may be a bit pushed for time this evening. We'll see how we get on. Um, the important one this evening will be the uh, amalgam one. Um, I may have an opportunity to get this PCB done uh, a bit earlier. Someone's offered. Um, a unique opportunity to get this PCB done. So um, that's become urgent and I need to cover it today, this evening. Uh, but before we do that, let's have a look at the uh, the notes for today. So community notes. There isn't an awful lot of community stuff. Um, on the forum, there was an interesting uh, post by Seedol. Uh, um, let me just get you the URL for that. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what Seedol does, but I think he works in a physics lab because that's what he's talking about. Um, and what he has said is that quite commonly uh, in physics labs uh, they are using they need to generate pulses of fairly specific lengths and durations and things so uh, he posted about that um, in fact what he said was I'm new to FPGA programming and thought of a small project to get me started. In the physics labs, we commonly use digital delay generators. These generate pulses at 
arbitrary of arbitrary time and have specific durations. Um, while some applications need very high time resolution, 100 megahertz of the lattice is really pretty useful for many applications. Um, and a number of companies selling these for thousands of dollars for four to eight channel channels. So I've just finished working on a version of open source delay generator and placed it on GitHub. Um, so let me give you that link as well. So that was quite interesting. Here's the GitHub uh, link. Uh, and he's actually using Black Eyes too, interestingly. And he's using a combination of the STM 32L433 that's on the Black Eyes 2, and he's communicating with that over QSPI, I think, or SPI, to the ICE 40 HX um, to do the control. And then he can control it all over the serial port. He's even written some, uh, um, some Jupyter pages. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever used Jupyter. Jupyter Notebook is uh well it's primarily it was like an interactive notebook written in python so you could have python code in to do data analysis and all sorts of great stuff um but more recently they support all sorts of different languages as well as python um but it's kind of an interactive um notebook format which is kind of cool. I've used it before to do things like machine learning and data analysis and stuff like that on projects. Um, uh, it's quite good for modeling and things like that as well. So have, have a look at his um, repository and you can see some examples there um, and all the source codes there as well. So that's kind of interesting. Um, I noticed there was a new um, there was an announcement in Hackster.io for a project called Cumo, Cumo, Cumo. Sorry, uh, let me give you a link for that. Um, if you remember, oh, what's going on here? I may have a few keyboard problems today, by the way, folks. I've got a new keyboard, and I'm still getting around my head. It is radically different to what I'm used to, and I have not got on top of it yet because I've been so busy with CAD stuff. Um, so QMO, if you take a look at it, um, I can actually just show you in browser with any luck, hopefully. Uh, show me the browser. And um, this is a little board that fits inside the USB port. Now, there's history here because this follows on from what was FOMU, which is an FPGA in the same form factor on one of these little boards that fits inside the um, USB port. Uh, and they talk about the Tomu family. I think it started off as a Tomu, which was just a microcontroller that fits inside the USB port. Uh, so the interesting thing with this one is, is it uses the EOS Free. Now the EOS Free is from a company called QuickLogic. Um, and the EOS Free is a combination of an M4 microcontroller, M4F ARM microcontroller with a small FPGA inside the same package. Um, and I think in this case, it's in a, you know, wafer scale or wafer level uh, 
package uh, in order to fit on this board. And I think this particular one has about two and a half thousand LUTs. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And that's starting a crowdsourcing campaign. Uh, URL for that. So I've been, I put my name down to be notified about this because this is kind of interesting. Um, now, Quick Logic aren't new here. They were, they've already announced, they already do a couple of boards. I think they do a feather format board with one of their chips on, which is about $49, $50, maybe more. It depends who you buy it from. Uh, and they were in community news, not necessarily arts, but in community news because um, they support the open source FPGA tools, i.e. EOSIS, etc. And that's what's used for programming the FPGA. So they went with that straight off, out from the gate, which is kind of cool. So this, in turn, also uh, has that, and it also means you can use N, MyGen, etc. with it as well. So it's really interesting. I mean, this is absolutely tiny. Now, I've no idea what the cost would be. I, I did at one point look at the um, Quick Logic chips, and they seem rather expensive to me, but I mean, you're paying for the convenience, I think, more than anything. But I can't remember where they were. I did. I thought it was Mauser, but when I looked on Mauser, I couldn't couldn't find it. Let me just double check again. Uh, if anyone else knows differently um, about where these are available, so it'd be quick logic. No, I don't find anything under quick logic or EOS S3. Yes. Uh, I mean, for anyone following knows where you can buy these um, I mean, it's not obvious. I did find something earlier, but not the. Uh, I found the um, the boards, but not the chips. Hold on. Well, let's just go to their site. It's probably easier. So the actual chip is this one, uh, EOS MCU FPGA. So this is the uh, page for the actual chip, as it says here. Easy to use, low cost dev kit, open source software, tool chains integrates into your workflow with multiple product delivery packages, CSP, which is the wafer scale one, BGA and SIP module. Um, 100% free and open source tools, including Zephyr and free RTOS for integrated ARM Cortex M4FU. So that's obviously supported on those or configurations supported on those operating systems. Symbiflow supports Verilog to Bitstream for integrated eFPGA. They, they refer to it as eFPGA, the part inside this chip um, that does the FPGA part. And I think it's got like a wishbone. So the arm has an AHB to wishbone, which then connects to the um, FPGA wishbone fabric. Now, I don't know if that's a hard wishbone or not. I don't know all the details on it. I had heard of it before. Um, it's an introduction, introduction, quick, quick feather. It's one of the ones they talk about. So um, data sheet. So yeah, let's have a quick look at the data sheet.
highlights. Um, um, I think I've got the wrong one. Uh, not that one. Oh, here's a block diagram look with the EFPGA in it. That's quite a bit of um, SRAM, interestingly. 512 kilobytes, but it doesn't seem to have any flash or ROM. It's very odd. And the uh, 512K SRAM is broken into four chunks of 128. One of which is in the low power mode, is enabled in low power mode. The other three are only enabled in the higher power modes. Um, which is quite interesting as well. Um, does it show? So if I do buy now, where does that take me? Do, 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 do. Oh yeah, so it, there's a development boards. Um, quick feather development kit, add to cart, so you do it directly through them, I guess. So it's like a feather format board with uh with the chip on it I'm guessing that this yeah I know originally when they started they were only selling direct but I'm pretty sure at some point they were on distribution one of the dis one of the bigger distributors like um Mouse or something, maybe, maybe that didn't work out or something. I don't know. There isn't a lot of information here, but anyhow, that's an interesting chip. I, I, I see a big future for those these kind of chips. However, it needs to be priced right, I guess. Um, certainly, when I looked at it before, because I did think about it from a doing a development board point of view and it's just more economical to put together a microcontroller along with the um, FPGA you get um, more gates and things uh, Laurie says uh, it uses Luke Valentry's um, tiny FPGA tools for the USB you mean that's interesting. Or are you talking about? So you wrote some Python stuff. So I guess both. But uh, yeah, quick logic. Anyhow, interesting company. Definitely worth keeping your eye on these guys. They're doing some interesting things. And that Q Q is it? Komu. Let's try to pronounce it. So it's like a really interesting. It's probably going to be a relatively low cost way of. Having a play. Um, so the crowd funding part of that is, is isn't running yet. It's pre pre campaign, but you know, uh, if you're already on crowdsource or whatever, then um, just uh, notify your interest. Um, just looking at their video, so sorry. I think it's a very interesting idea. I'd love to see it. Or well, I'd love to see more of this, this combination of um or oh, sorry, of controllers, microcontrollers with FPGAs in the same silicon package. Makes what the kind of things that we're into much easier. However, I'm not willing to pay that kind of premium for it at the moment. Um you know on one of our development boards, but it's something I'm keeping my eye on, definitely. Very interesting. Let's have a look at the link. Yeah. So this is the link to the development board from Laurie, thanks. It's kind of cool. 
Uh, and I was wondering if you could run Circuit Python or MicroPython in it. And I think it's certainly possible because you've got 512k, albeit all RAM. You might need to add um, flash. I don't know if this has got an external flash on the board. I'm guessing it will have. Um, I've got an accelerometer on here. Uh, I can't see a flash on there. Yeah, I'm not going to play the video, um, but yeah, um, if you go to that page, you can um, check out the videos as well. What I'm not sure though, it doesn't say anything about any flash. I don't how how does this work if you don't have any flash? Oh, won't it? Here we go. It's got a 2516 flash. I'm being stupid, it's the big chip here in the front. So yeah, that'll be a spy flash. They don't have, certainly on, I think when I looked at the microcontroller data sheet earlier, it has spy, but it doesn't support dual or quad spy. Um, just the regular, you know, duplex, four pin spy. One bit in, one bit out. Because um, you definitely need some some flash as well, but so yeah, if you wanted to run MicroPython or um, Circuit Python, Circuit Python, I don't, I don't think you could easily run because the USB part isn't supported by the microcontroller. It'd be a bit of a nightmare, but you could probably run MicroPython um, with that amount of RAM. You could probably Put your libraries in 256k of it. Do it that way. Load it in from the ROM. I guess. Sorry, from the flash. Anyhow, interesting. Is there anything else that I've missed on here? Is there? They talk. They, they've got a. AI tool as well, so they, they take a machine learning trained model, I think, and compress it down into a smaller model that fits in, presumably, in the FPGA, but there can't be room for much. Um, but yeah, interesting. If anyone's played around with this, let me know. I'd be fascinated to know um, what it's like in use. So moving swiftly on, uh, let's just go back here. Um, so where, oh, what's going on? There we go. Where are we? Yeah, so QMU or Co-Mo, maybe, I don't know. Unpronounceable. That'd be interesting. What do I want to talk about then? Is, it, is there any other pieces of news? Please let me know if you've got anything, folks. And I will uh, pass it on. Um, I, the thing that attracts me to the quick logic stuff is because I, I definitely believe in having hardcores next to the FPGA. If possible, it's always more efficient than just soft cores. So, um, yeah, putting both of those in the same package has got to be a big win. Um, I was even wondering about doing it myself, but it's very expensive to do. And unless you've got any volumes, the cost is very high. So it's... Um, it's not economically viable for uh, me to do right now. Yeah, 
Yeah, Laurie Griffiths is saying uh, it, it probably uses the uh, FPGA tools, the tiny FPGA tools, to do the flashing. I remember that that stuff was supported in the tiny FPGA stuff. Okay, right. So moving on, main subject of this stream. If we have time at the end, we might do a bit more of the stepper stuff, but let's see how we get on. Um, but the main one I want to talk about here is an album. I've been going over various designs over the last few weeks. Some of them radically different to, to the others. So um, I want to show you what I want to go with, and I've got to do it quite quickly. I have an opportunity, if I can get it finished swiftly, I've got an opportunity to get some PCB made uh, for me to do some testing um, very quickly. But I've got to finish the design in record time in order to do that, which means prioritizing it amongst everything else. So let's just bring up the um, cat and go through this. So, this is a design that I want to go with. Okay, we even potentially got a name for it, look, instead of the amalgam, which is just a code name. Black stack. Why is it black stack? Well, because it's stacks of tiles and this main board. Um, if you followed the previous streams, then you will be familiar with the. Uh, idea of the tiling system a mechanically stable good electrically solid electrical connection whereby you have a kind of board the main board with your FPGA and microcontroller etc on a memory then you can put these tiles on top and they literally screw down and those posts can also provide high current as well optionally if you want them um, so the rework of the Black Eyes 5 board enables you to have two of these tiles as well as a mix mod. Now on the ECP5 board, which is, is currently under codename Amalgam, we were originally looking at a um, system on a module so a board that plugs into another board. Now the problem with going that route is cost. Because you always need two boards to do anything. Uh, and I've been trying to find a way to do this and do it economically and be able to support the tiles and multi-stacking. And I just couldn't find a decent way of doing that. So I've given up on that. And I'm going to... I'm basically just going to cut to the chase and do a board that has uh, the stacking ability designed in. So it won't be a two part, it will just be a main board that has the tile support so that you can do stacks above and below. Four tiles in other words. So if we go look at the uh, design here, there's two on the top, there's one tile. And that covers this half on the top and then here's another tile and that sits over this half and then you've got the same thing repeated the ones in blue here are on the bottom so you can have another tile on the bottom and then on the other side another tile on the bottom so effectively what you could end up with is three layers two tiles on top the main FPGA and uh, microcontroller board in the middle the jam in the sandwich if you like and then at the bottom the bottom slice of the bread if you like are the other two tiles so, so it's kind of a free layer affair but you don't have to populate all layers you populate what you need depending on how many um, how many tiles you want to fit into your stack you could just go with the top two if you like or just one or you could go three or four depending on what you're trying to do 
Um, the other thing I've included here is double P mods. And then in the middle there, you've got JTAG as well. That's really just for backward compatibility with P mods. Uh, that wouldn't be the primary usage of this board, but if you've already got P mod assets that you want to reuse, it might be useful. Um, they don't give you the kind of mechanical stability, which is why we're looking at using this tile route. Uh, in terms of functionality, you've probably seen some of this before anyhow. Let's cover the left hand side. So we've got the ECP5 here. So that will be available in either a 12F or a 45F. It's a 256 ball version of the ECP5 of a 0.8 pitch, mil pitch. Um, connected to that, at the bottom we have a MIPI type FPC connector. Primary uh, uh, use for that is for driving higher resolution LCD type displays. It's the primary application for that. Um, there is no native MIPI support in the ECP5, so we have to emulate it. It means using twice as many pins, unfortunately. But we've got pins to spare here. Um, there's also a USB connector to the ECP5, so it can do a USB uh, OTG. So it could be device or um, or host, depending on um, on the on the HDL that you provide. Um, hoping to take advantage of Kate's uh, FPGA stuff for that. Uh, we've also got here um, DDR RAM, so we'll have effectively. I think for the 12F, we're probably going to have 32 megabytes and for the 45 I'll probably have 64 megabytes don't quote me on that yet but that's what I'm I think that's the way that it's going to go uh, there's also a possibility of having a direct connect flash which is underneath the board here currently there are some issues going that route but it's still my mind hasn't made up on that, but I'm probably going to include the socket even if I don't include the chip. Um, the connector in the middle here is for JTAG because the USB 5 supports JTAG as well. We don't need to use that to program it. We can program that from the onboard microcontroller. But if you want to do the JTAG stuff, it'd be good to have that exposed. So I'm intending to bring the JTAGs out to that. It's tricky getting all these pins out. To do this board, I have to use six layers and I'm hoping I can get it fit into six layers there's a lot of balls to break out and they're not brilliantly placed etc it's a bit of a pain in the ass frankly routing the ECP5 that's probably the worst thing about it um, there's also a whole bunch of regulators needed I need to provide one volt eight 2 volt 5, 3 volt 3, and 1 volt 2. Four regulators, all of which are switch mode. No, three of which are switch mode. Um, connected to the, um, in this case, it's north. Um, we have a HDMI mini out, which I am going to wire up correctly this time. And uh, also we have a CSI FPC connector for a camera coming in. Now it's a single camera, not a double camera, because I need the extra connectivity. So we won't be able to do stereo with this easily unless you add it on one of the tiles. That's still possible. Or even, not sure if you can do it on the P mod. Um, you've then got to the tile connectors. Each tile connector has 12 GPIOs from the FPGA, plus it has SPI, plus a chip select. Now, moving over to the right side of the board here, may I draw your attention to... Um, up here we've got a few of the uh, switch modes. It's going to be another one 
We have USBs in the top corner. That looks a bit confusing at the moment. Um, let me come back to that in a minute. Uh, we've got the real-time clock crystal, 32 kilohertz crystal, and a high-speed crystal, 25 meg or 20 meg, probably 25. And then we have the microcontroller here. The microcontroller here is an STM32 F7 or H7. So I'm thinking with the 12F, I do an F7. With the 45F, we do a H7. So basically, there's quite a big difference between the uh, 45 config and the 12 config, but they are PIN compatible. Okay. So the STM32 is an F7 class, which is very fast. The F7 runs at 200, up to 216 megahertz. It's very powerful. That's 256K RAM. Uh, we've got an external uh, flash on this as well, which I'll probably make a, I think it's a 32 megabit for memory. Um, the, um, it has, I think it's 64K built-in flash as well on the F7 and on the H7. We have 128k built-in flash plus we have up to a, about a megabyte's worth of RAM broken into different sections that have different benefits depending on how you're using them. I'm not going to go too much into that in a moment. I can bring up the data sheet when we need to. So that's the STM 32F, either H7 or F7. So powerful little components supporting the ECP5. And obviously the STM32 is in charge of programming the ECP35. And there are also two um, USB connections to those. There's also an SD card connected via MMC type protocol to the STM32. So you've got card support. Um, and then down here you've got the option of adding a um, ESP32 module of some sort. Not sure which one's yet. Let's see how we get on with the Black Ice 5. If that kind of works out okay, then we'll probably use similar similar module. Um, I mean, it's still possible to use an S2 version of that, but. I'm not sure if there's any benefit to doing so. Quick connect and a couple of uh, push buttons. We can probably squeeze some more LEDs and stuff on there, maybe a few RGB LEDs. I haven't done that yet. I think I just have the one down here, one RGB LED. But we might be able to do a bit more. I haven't done all the pinouts yet, so I'm still trying to work out what I've got left. And I'm moving things around, trying to get it ready so I can actually route this in the next few days in order to meet this damn deadline I have. Well, it's an opportunity really, but very little time. So let me just cover the USBs as well, because it's important. So what I'm thinking of doing here with the USBs is interesting. I don't know if this is going to work. What I'd like to do with it is, hold on. Can I get that? Yeah, let's get that out of the way. Rather than using the regular micro USB connectors, which I've just removed there, I want to use two USB C connectors. And we do have two USB 2 full speed, not high speed, channels on the STM32. So in terms of communication, that can work as one could possibly work as the uh, as a um, storage access mass storage device. The other can work as either programming or uh, CDC communication USB serial type port. Going the USB. 
B root also means that we might be able to do power over USB negotiations and the USB-C. And that effectively enables us to deliver quite a large amount of power to the board, particularly given that I put two USB-C connectors on there. So I'm still investigating the reality of being able to do that, but I'm hoping that I could theoretically take full power if I write the relevant software. I say write, a lot of it's actually written um, or examples have been written for STM32, which I think lean on the how to a degree. I mean, the how doesn't have direct support on this range of um, microcontrollers. It does on some of the G range, but not, not on these particular ranges. Um, the G range has some extra hardware support built in for the power negotiation device control on USB-C. Um, so it, it, you do it manually. It's a, com it's a USB conversation, basically, that needs to occur if you want to go beyond the uh, standard amounts. So that means you move from relatively low current 5 volt, you can go all the way up to uh, 20 volt, and I think it's about 100 watts on each connector. So if I could get that working on both connectors, I've effectively got access to 200 watts, which enables all sorts of things to happen on this board without having to deal with extra separate power supplies and stuff. Nori's asking what we're going to be running on the STM32. So what I'd like to do is run MicroPython to have a C layer it does things like the power negotiation and stuff and the low level comms. So serial to USB, for example. So we've got that built in and programming. And then run CircuitPython, not CircuitPython, sorry, MicroPython. Maybe later CircuitPython as well. So you can choose between the two. But certainly MicroPython sitting on top of that. Um, it should work quite well particularly on the H7, be a bit more constrained on the F7 because there's less memory. So what am I thinking here? Because this, this is kind of tricky. It's going to require um, some interesting challenges around the MicroPython side. So normally what happens with MicroPython is you have enough flash to fit the basic libraries in. Enough flash means, I think, uh, 196k is normally considered, you know, the bare bones, bare minimum. Normally it's 256. So I would be using, I would have those libraries stored, stored in the external flash. And then I load them into RAM and use them from RAM. Okay. So I've got enough RAM to do that. Now, as well as the onboard RAM, and on the H7, you've got four times as much RAM as you do on the F7. So in addition to that, I've got, uh, I'm using the FMC feature on, that exists on both the STM32 F7 and the H7. Now the FMC feature, if you're not familiar with it, is, um, it's uh, ST's um, external um, uh, memory controller. Uh, and in this case, it um, has a 24-bit wide address and it has a 16-bit wide data, but those two are multiplexed on the same lines. And it has a bunch of control signals as well. These are about 27 lines altogether, or 28, something like that. But it's pretty pretty fast, and it will run... Well, it depends on whether it's the H7 or the F7 as to what speed it will run. But it could run, on, I think, probably 100 on the... Uh, 100 meg on the F7. I can't remember what it is on the, um, on the H7. And 
because I have that connected into the FPGA fabric in the ECP5, I can then effectively create the equivalent of a PS RAM interface inside the ECP5. And in terms of the address range, that could, that would make all the SRAM that's available in the ECP5, which I think is uh, 126 meg, sorry, 126k of internal SRAM on a 12, and then twice that, nearly, you know, that 256 on the 45 so that will be within the memory map available over the external memory controller from the STM32 and that could be good because you could then use that for displaying things like the frame buffer and stuff or you could just use it as a kind of a temporary store or you could use it with the camera inputs etc or the LCD output and then also um, mapped into that space um, via some sort of internal bus inside the ECP5 um, will be the DDR RAM up to 32 megabytes. I think I can only map 32 because of 2 to 24. I think it's, hold on, 2 to the 24 is 16 meg. But don't forget, 16 be wide, which is a quick equivalent to 32 megabytes. So that will be mapped into the memory space as well. So those two memories are accessible internally by the ECP5 and any core that may run in there. But also it's externally accessible to the STM32. The uh, reason that's important is because you need that. So if I'm going to run uh, MicroPython or CircuitPython on the STM32, you need the extra memory. So we actually, we can use that stuff as heat and we can partition it nicely. So maybe the fast SRAM part could be the, you know, display uh, memory area, like a frame buffer or whatever from the STM32. And then the DDR RAM will be PS RAM muxed back through the FMC um, as heat effectively but it'll be faster than you know what you see on something like the ESP32s which use spy or quad spy um, so we have four times the band the width because we're using a 16-bit interface um, and well in fact the address bus is 24 bits so that saves a significant number of cycles getting the address muxed in um, and Certainly with bursting and stuff, we can get some really good high-speed throughput. Um, plus, we've got a lot of it, which is kind of cool. I mean, you might even be able to do some page memory stuff if you wanted. I don't know quite how that will work, but um, yeah. So in answer to Laurie's question, there will be a C core that does the low-level communication stuff virtual USB serial etc and fat system fat file system for the SD card and all ROM partitions but those will also be available inside MicroPython as well so it'll be a combination of MicroPython and C this is all very ambitious with lots of new stuff yes Laurie it is, but it's kind of what I've already been working on. It's just, um, it's going deeper into that, really. But I'd love to be using Python, uh, presenting it as Python, and having all that memory available, etc., and partition nicely with display areas and stuff, so that it's easy to use from an application point of view, and then use the MMIGEN. Yeah, so it's like Alloy in that sense. It's just alloy on steroids, if you like, because you've got a much more powerful FPGA. We've got a lot more memory to play with. Uh, generally, it's a more integrated system. I mean, I don't have to do a lot at the low level because I'm just mapping it um, 
because it's an external memory controller the hardware is already done I've just got to map everything in when it's check out the linking and stuff um, there will be some Python stuff how I configure the running micro Python um, it's going to be slightly different from what already exists out there There's, the one thing I have in my favor here is that MicroPython, uh, a lot of it runs on STM32 chips. A lot of the boards that are out there. And a lot of people using it are quite familiar with the STM32s. So um, it's not like this isn't new ground because um, people have already done a lot of this. It's just the memory configuration is slightly different here. In the way that we're optimizing it plus we're bunging in the fpga just to add some complications and the fmc bus ps ps uh, ram muxed interface isn't actually that difficult um when you start building in the bursts synchronous bursts and stuff then it gets a bit more tricky um but you don't have to do all of that up front you can do it bit by bit and enable these features as you go Excuse me for a sec, folks. Ken. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm streaming. You're on the stream, mate. Say hello. <laughs> Say hello to the folks. The phone. Oh, sorry, you're on the um, uh, the, the, the group. Yes. Yeah. Um, call uh, me back when you're not streaming anymore. Yeah, I'll call you back a bit <laughs> later, mate. I got your files, by the way, that you sent. All right, good. I just Speak haven't soon. had a chance right. to open them yet. Yeah, sure. Speak soon. All right, cheers, Ken. Speak to you a bit. <laughs> Timely. He, he he's um, Ken is working. The stuff he's working on or stuff that we want to work on together but he's he's doing most of it quite frankly because he's much more experienced at this um as i mentioned to you before it's educational in in nature but um he's currently in the throes of designing uh, uh a cpu out of ttl not that's you know a first because he did work with the gigatron staff and you know uh, if you if if you if you know Ken, you know he's been kind of working on that stuff for a little while. Uh, what we're working on is mixed across several different disciplines, but uh, he's kind of working on the TTL part as well. And we've got um we're using a simulator piece of software called Digital, which is really really cool to play around with. And he sent me some of the um, initial parts of that design, which I was looking for yesterday. It's a bit like a uh, trip down memory lane with all the TTL parts and stuff um, but I may uh, the design is will also be in probably in Verilog and also I, I want to do an MMIGEN version as well but it's a it's for it's an educational uh, um, design anyhow sorry what were you saying Laurie um, would be hard to run Saxon Sock Linux, which needs an SD card connected to the FPGA. Yeah, but it's very easy to add that. Um, sorry, dead simple to add that. Uh, and maybe if I've got enough, you know, IOs left, I could. Um, in fact, let me make a note of that. I'll see what I can do. So I can probably squeeze that in. That's not particularly difficult. Let me just make a note. Uh, um, uh, what do I need to do? Uh, SD. God. Two. Oh. 
Now, so I don't forget. <laughs> yeah, but do you actually want to run Linux? People do, I suppose. There'll be enough memory if you want to do that. So, just going to be, isn't it? Don't you find it appallingly slow running Linux on ECP5? Laurie? Um, what else are you saying? ULX free has SD card connected to both FPGA and ESP32. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, it's entirely possible to have both. Uh, yeah, I should I'll tell him you said hello, Laurie. <laughs> uh, BBC Micro, Accord Atom, a few other retro computers need that too. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be difficult to add that in, to be honest, Laurie. I just got to make sure there's enough um, IOs. I need six IOs. I could always um, combine them with the um, um, P mods. One of the P mods. That would mean that it's one or the other, but you know. This isn't primarily a PMOD design, so I'm less worried about that. Point taken. No, it says Linux is quite responsive and can run four CPUs on the 45F. Is that four VEX risks you're talking about? Four VEX risk fives. That's quite impressive if that's the case. Although presumably they only run about 70 megahertz. Wait for Linux is quite slow. But yeah, on the 45 certainly, because there's quite a bit, you've got 64 um, megabytes of memory, which will be enough to run like a command line Linux. I guess you could. You could even do a frame buffer, but um, yeah, you're pushing it a bit. 52 megahertz. There you go. Oh, it runs in 32 as well. Yeah, I guess it depends what you're loading in the kernel. Is that that's is that that's based on Saxon sock? You say not not Litex. Both from, yeah. How long does it take to boot? <laughs> About twenty seconds, wow. That's pretty good. It's impressive. You know what, it'd probably be even faster if you could run it on the STM32, but you'd have to create some sort of memory management unit. Can you do a memory management unit on the other side of the FMC bus? I don't know much about memory management units. Presumably, you've got an MMU in the Saxon sock now. Because it would run faster. If you imagine if you had the H7 STM32 and can run it on there. But without the MMU, it would be... Bit shit, but I don't think you can put the MMU the other side of the external memory bus. I don't think that will work, would it? Couldn't integrate that into the um, uh, what do you call it? 
the uh, into the memory bus inside the FPGA. Interesting, but yeah, I think we can solve the SD card one. So I'll add that in, Laurie. Anything else you notice that we need to change? What do you think about the um, the peripherals? Am I missing anything else or peripheral rise wise? Saxon, Laurie's saying Saxon sock Linux is surprisingly usable and now has a native is that an LCC compiler that rings a bell LCC that's that's a small C compiler isn't it it's been around for a while as opposed to something like GCC yeah yeah interesting um I wonder if you could do the Rust compiling on it. That might be a bit um, a bit too heavy. You probably want to do that externally. I tell you what might work is um, V. Check that out when you get time. No, the V language is quite interesting. Uh, buttons, yeah, I could add some buttons. I've got some buttons and LEDs to add. Um, that would just be down to how many how many IOs I've got left. I mean, I could double up on um, on the P mods. Add some buttons on those pins that won't won't harm the P mods. It's not a problem. That let me put a couple in already. How many do you need? B. What do I want? B. 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 Four. Mm. On the FPGA side, let's put them here for the moment. I don't know, they might be better over this side. Couple of buttons. Also has some more LEDs over here possibly but until I know how many IOs I've got left couldn't tell you how many be nice to have like four LEDs uh, if we do RGB LEDs and four RGB LEDs would be excellent but I need seven pins for that which is rather a lot V4C, there'll be a few LEDs in here. Um, so we've got the kind of, we've got an LCD, high speed LCD via MIP. We've got uh, a CSI camera. So that will accept like a Raspberry Pi camera, by the way. Um, battery backup for RTC would be useful. Yeah, I've got the, um, I've got the, uh, Low frequency oscillator on there for the um, RTC, but you're right. I need to add the. Um, let's make a note of that actually. Uh, we do need the um, 
uh, SMD um, uh, what's it called? This is a board mounted thing, isn't it? Add the SMD back. It's easy to do. In fact, that could go down here. Um, if I've got any in my libraries, hold on. Oh, this is being slow. What's it doing? Lithium batteries. Is there a surface mount one here? Something like that, maybe. CR927. What size is a CR9? 10 mil. One of these would probably do. I wonder how big that is on there. Do a look. Like this, it's quite massive, man. He's massive. That could actually go here or on the rear. CR one two two five. I forget all those sizes. It's probably similar to this sort of thing. Um, oh, it doesn't say on here. One twelve twenty. I think this talks about. Oh, twelve twenty five. Twelve mil. There is a 10 mil one as well, I saw. Hold on. What's that look like? Edit. Add. What is that? That's a CR9277. Hold on. Oh, why doesn't it list which battery this takes? It just gives a size. Is it a 12 mil battery? This is probably going to be very similar, I shouldn't wonder. Hold on. See other possibility. This looks smaller though. Hmm. Let me just quickly look up something. Um 
CR twelve twenty five CR Dimensions. About twelve mil. There's a diameter of about twelve mil. Which I think is what that already does. That talks about twelve twenty rather than twelve twenty five. Um on here, wait a minute, the one I've got, Laurie actually. Let's see what this says. So this is similar looking to that. This is a 2032. This one. Hold on. Panasonic. I don't know if a 2032 is bigger or smaller. Anyhow, I'll have to check that out. So I've got two footprints on there. I'll leave them on there for a moment and check out which is the best. Probably best to put that on the bottom rather than top, given the choice. Um, trouble is, I've got the um, thirty-two USB thirty-two module on the bottom at the moment. Could put that on the top, of course. Anyhow. I will have a look at that. Anything else you can think of? Right, so what do you think of this uh, USB-C option and having high power coming in from the USB-C? There is an interesting... Uh, people are already doing it, so it should just be a case of looking at their code. So let me show you. Um, I found something earlier here. Who else was using this? Uh, that don't need that, don't need that, don't need that. Uh, hold on. Ah, oh, yes, yes. Uh, let me see if I can bring this up. Sorry, didn't mean to play my music. Um, Jan Henrik, he makes a bunch of stuff, I think it's on Tindy, um, called, he does the Otter Iron. Let me bring this up. So if we look at his repo, this is interesting. Um, I'll just turn the browser on so you guys can see it. So this is uh, his GitHub page. So he has the Otter Iron. I don't know if you've seen this before. This is really cool. So it's a USB powered iron. Um, I know there's been several generations of this. Uh, and his solution is a um, STM32 based. And um, so this USB takes the um, 
T100 blade bits that insert into the end into here. But he's using the USB C power delivery on this. Which is cool. I want to build one of these. Very cool. But more importantly, um, he has uh, he's done quite a bit of work on he's got a uh, 32F070 board that he does, but in his repositories, he's also got. Uh, hold on. In here. Here, look. Well, this is forked from. What does he say it's forked from? So he's using a fork from Clay Hogs PD Buddy PD Buddy firmware. So if you look at this code, he's got. Uh, this is STM thirty two zero seven two based. Uh, and if you look, the important thing is. Got a bunch of files that handle the um, <laughs> I'm just looking at that comment. That's a really good comment. <laughs> Source. Last comment. Fixed shit. <laughs> My kind of git comment. <laughs> Fixed shit. <laughs> um so yeah, this library implements a subset of the USB power delivery specification revision two, version one point three, revision three, blah blah blah. So for microcontrollers running Chibi iOS, oh, that's what wasn't what I was looking at. Hold on, the library's API is not yet considered stable. Um. Is it this code I was looking at? No, it wasn't this one. Hold on. Hold on. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong repository here. Lib source. Ew, I recognize this. I don't think this is the repo I was originally looking at. Right. It's not this one.
I can't remember exactly. But I was looking through, I'm sure it was on the uh, Kian site. Yeah, definitely wasn't this one. Hmm. Uh, notice also, I'm using GitHub. Now has a dark mode. My God. So I had to switch that on straight away. I will need to look through his bits and bobs. I can't remember which one it was, but there was a bunch of... Um, PD, USB, uh, library pieces. Damn if I can remember which the, um, which one it was. Mm. Oh, somewhere. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, no, it wasn't this one. Anyhow, point being, there's a few in the wild for doing the uh, USB-C power delivery uh, based on the STM32 stuff. So you're right, I am being ambitious, Laurie, but some of it's already out there. So... Um, I'm not starting from scratch on that front. I just wish I could remember which one it was. Damn. Hmm. Anyhow, we can swing back round to that. So, what are you saying? Amiga works best with free USBs for keyboard, mouse, and controller. Yeah, but you probably want to do that via a tile, have a retro tile. Because. Uh, free USBs would be a whole bunch of um, IOs required. So you do it on a tile. <sighs> but you could also support <sighs> things like the PS2. So yes, that's the plan. Um, what else did I need to cover on here? Um, yeah, I mean, no problem getting that stuff on because I've still got some room. Routing it all is another matter, of course, but you know.
Carl would be, uh, Laurie says, Carl would be fine, but an extra one on the board would be good if you had enough pins. Oh, an extra USB, you mean? There's only one USB connected to the uh, FPGA at the moment. Yeah, trouble is where to put it on the board. Not only that, it's, I, I don't know if I'm going to have enough pins left over. Oh, tired this evening. Uh, yeah, it's difficult to squeeze another one on if I keep the P mods there. I mean, if I didn't have the P mods, I'd have a few more pins and could put some more USB in. But I'm just thinking having the P mods is useful because people may already have invested in the P mod. Um, the P mod uh, standard, i.e., they have P mod boards that they may wish to use with this. I'm sure you've got a few, all right. In fact, I know you've got a few. I need to leave something to go on the tiles, anyhow. <laughs> right, uh, I've still got some time, so um, we could do a bit, we could talk a bit more about this, or. Uh, we could um, do a bit more towards the spy part of the um, stepping. Um, there are just so many implementations for the ULX3 which will run on this with only minor changes. Yeah, well, it's the same FPGA. Oh, excuse me. I say same, slightly different package, but similar functionality. I mean, on a retro board, what would you have? You could have a bunch of USBs. You could have a, what else would you want to put on there? Game controller connectors, maybe. Audio. Yeah, I don't have any audio on this board. By audio, what do you mean? Just a couple of FPGA pins connected to uh, an audio connector. Hold on. That may be possible. It may well be possible. In fact, what did I have this on recently? Bear with me. We, oh, we didn't have an audio on there, did we? Hold on. No. Um, what did I use? Hold on. Yes. This is the connector that I wanted to use. Just put that on there. We need to find a home for this puppy. Could go somewhere like this, maybe. Oh, 
I actually got more room than appears here. Because a lot of this stuff's on the other side of the board. Uh, yeah. Uh, put that over here, maybe. ULX Frias has four pin FPGA audio and SPD. But just a couple of pins is all that most things use. ULX Free has four pins for each channel. One advantage of that is that it's louder. But that would need to be on a tile. Interesting. Um, yeah, I'd normally just do something simple. If you're going to do anything more complex, you probably want a codec of some sort to get decent quality. I mean, you can do what's called class D, which is a differential output for each channel. That would require four. Um, and then you need a kind of D class driver. Some fets or something. I mean, you could do it directly from the pins, possibly. It's kind of a differential, the D class output. There are ways of doing it. I've not done it on a board before, but I've seen um, I've seen the idea in circuits and stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, again. When I get a bit further on this, I will know how many pins I've got left. But probably I would do minimum on the board. And then maybe have um, one input. I think that connector has like three inputs, three, three connectors on it. So you could do one input, and two outputs. It's like a connector for um, a phone. My frames per second looks really low for some reason. Data rate looks good. Weird. Um, yeah, I'll probably keep it simple. And then if you want something more sophisticated, you could do a proper audio tile that has all the digital stuff and codecs and all that kind of thing. Uh, I think you know that's that's a design area in itself. Not only that, but you could actually do quite a nice multi-channel uh, tile, including things like a D D class monitor and all sorts of clever stuff. You need someone that's kind of into the audio stuff, really, to to guide on what would go on something like that. It'd be a good. Uh, Good little project for an audio audio sort because <laughs> the FPGAs are capable of doing an awful lot of channels if required concurrently. Plus, you've got all the DSPs there as well, which is kind of nice. So yeah, audio good. I'm glad you were you were here, Laurie, because there's quite a few things that I've forgotten to put on here. And there is room, you know, plenty of room, although we're starting to run out now. I'm not really looking forward to this routing, because there's a lot to root. I have to do the DDR as well, which is a pain in the ass. But I do have six layers, so, you know, 
I've also got the external memory bus from the STM32 into the uh, uh, ECP5, which is fun. Not. Hmm. Yeah, so the thinking with the USB C's, if I get the power delivery, USB C power delivery code working on the STM32, it shouldn't be too difficult. Actually, testing it was more difficult than anything else. Getting a decent power supply with two USB C outputs that run to the standard. Um, that would effectively give us a combined 200 watt. Uh, supply and there's a whole bunch of projects I'd like to do with this using tiles um, that could benefit from that power so obviously if you're doing kind of motor control stuff that kind of power is great for running uh, a bunch of stepper motors more than enough um, but you can also use it for doing LED lighting rigs um i've worked on projects like this before so you know this kind of the third world rigs um which um i've designed before which use a combination it's a bit like a poe so basically you have ethernet connected lighting systems which are very good so you could do like an 18 or 24 port lighting system uh, or if you wanted even slightly less sophisticated, you could do a lot more uh, LED things. Those are good for things like emergency lighting systems, but also things like mobile lighting systems for things like, you know, boats, caravans, camping sites, all sorts of different things or things that you just put up very quickly. Um, you normally combine that with an MPPT and a solar panel and some batteries. Uh, which is kind of cool. But um, the other thing I thought of doing on tiles is doing a PoE tile. So on a PoE tile, um, there's a relatively low cost chip that will give four ports per tile. Or is it five ports per tile? Four ports per tile. Uh, and you could have up to four of those if you wanted. Although you probably want one master gigabit tile. For your input so you'd have three lots of four 12 ports out and then gigabit in which would be kind of cool um, again that's quite useful things like uh, mobile applications wiring up boats and stuff Would it drive a 64, 64 LED panel? Well, you could do a tile that did that, that's easy. I don't know, 64, 64 panel, how much power it takes, but it's a fraction of what we're talking about here. 200 watts is a lot. Uh, you know, LED lighting PSUs are about 200 watt upwards, depending on how many, how many lights you're supporting. So you could actually run a, bunch of LED matrix matrices you could do a board of them plus you can do all sorts of power add-ons for this board uh, using the high power connectors screws so if you look at these, we have the grounds or comet naught volts on the outside, V minuses, and then the V pluses on the inside for the high, high power supplies to the tiles. So you could do a board underneath that this all sits on that um, could do anything. It could be an MPPT from a solar panel, for example, with a battery uh, monitoring circuitry on it to monitor, you know, uh, lipos or something be relatively easy you just add it to the stack and then you'd have to jerry link in um 
probably I squared C for the battery monitor. Uh, depends. If it had its own microcontroller, then I, I squared C. Like plenty, you could just use a quick connect to connect that up. So that would create a four layer stack. Uh, and that kind of thing is good for like um, if you're building like a robotics control unit for a mobile system. It could be like a small boat system. It could be a, you know, a, a, a road or terrain robot. It could be any any number of different things really. There's a lot of things that you can do with this. Which is, you know, one of the reasons I'm interested in going down this route because I'd really like to start building a whole bunch of stuff, the stuff that I really, really would like to build. So, um, not just, you know, do development boards, but actually build some stuff, all these things, projects that I've had on my plan for a while. I'm sure you've got some as well, Laurie. You could do a good gaming board that sits on top of this. For example, the gaming pads and things. Right, um, how are we doing for time? Oh, crikey. Uh, hmm. You could write a little bit of code. What do you reckon, guys? A little bit of um, margin. Start adding some support for spy stuff. We won't get it all done, but we can start doing a little bit, maybe. I really need some more tea. I'm out of tea. Hmm. Right. Let's call it quits on that and let's just have a quick look at Sim Kill. So I was just going to start putting in. So if you remember where we were last time, so we had the step and we had direction and step. We had all that running and we fixed the issues with that. But what we really need is a stepper controller that's capable of sitting in between SPI and um, and the stepper motor. Um, so, excuse my typing because as I say, I'm just getting used to this new um, keyboard actually. Oh my, what do I want? I want, um, uh, I need to import what we've done. Alloy Spy. Uh, I do, 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 do. Uh, what is it called? Uh, Um, what was it? I called it, I think I did a bit of renaming as well, so this may have changed. I think I called it Stepper Motor. I think I changed it to Camel Space. Um, hold on. I oh, know. What am I talking about? Um, to bring in the spy stuff first. Oh, my device. Yes. Um, I'm going to need the stepper motor stuff. So 
Um, uh, what did I rename it to? Stefan Luther, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and I renamed it to proper class type casing. Oh, what are doing? So I need those two. Um, what else would I need? I need some Enmigen stuff. So Laurie's saying it'd be a good idea to um, have this code in um, GitHub so we can review where we are. So you're right, I need to do that. I will need to do that to make it easier. Uh, I don't have it there at the moment. You have to bear with me. We need what are we going to need? Um, and my chin. And my gen or in my gen boards and my gen. Um, what do we want? Oh, all the usual ones, cat. We're going to need almost definitely. We're going to need uh, elaborable, elaboratable, sorry. Uh, we're going to need um, signals and module signals. And modules. module um, hold on gonna need the build stuff as well uh, no, imagine dot build is it Said, I'm still getting used to this keyboard. Uh, oh, damn it! Import. Um, what are we gonna need? We're gonna need platform. Do we need anything else? I'll do for the moment. Uh, oh, what should we call this? Let's call it Stepper Motor Controller, shall we? Um, I think. Uh, oh, damn it. I always get that wrong on this keyboard. This is all ass about face for me. Ah, uh, not stepper motor. No, 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 no. Stepper controller. Oh, let's get my capitalization right. Yes, and that needs to be elaboratable, does it not? Ah, 
I will get used to these keys eventually. Okay, cool. Let's create some bits that we're going to need. So, um, so we need a kind of move signal to do the move. Um, Just a one bit signal. What else do we need? Uh, Need a signal back saying we're ready for the next one. I think. So the information coming from serial will be in the form. What did we talk about last time? We talked about having a, a start delay and then a number of steps. So the start delay, that's equivalent to the speed. Number of steps maybe and the change per step, whether that's accelerating or decelerating. So the change per step would be zero. If if it's a member, we had the. Let me bring up the um, thing to remind us. Otherwise, we'd be working in the dark here. I just only thought I hope I the um Yeah, I did did say this. Blimey, I thought for a minute I'd lost that. Uh, let me just turn this on so you can see it, folks. Just to remind you what we had here. Hold on, let me turn this on. Remember this drawing from last week? So this is the a section of the um, uh, the stepping and the speed. So here we're going at a constant speed. Then we're accelerating, then we're going at a constant speed, which is normally the maximum speed, then we're decelerating, and then we're going at a constant speed, or zero speed in this case. Uh, and then we break this up. This is called trapezoidal 
motion control where you have these kind of sections broken up. So what you need to know is where you're coming from and going to effectively. So you start speed or the delay between the pulses and then how much to increment on each step which is really acceleration or how much to decrement on each step coming down. So yes, let's uh, turn it off now. Just, just a reminder. Look at that. So um, the other signals we're going to need here then. So the information coming from serial will be, or will consist of, um, what will it consist of? A start. Start. Is it a start? Start. Uh, um, delay. Or reciprocal of speed. Which will be um, a signal. That is... Uh, eight bits wide because remember we were going to use sorry when i say it's eight bits it was eight bits seven bits plus sign is what it was uh, in this case it will be eight bits start um oh fuck excuse my french damn it keyboard i will get used to you and start what was the other one i said we need the number of steps don't we which is assigned eight bits or another seven bits of information plus the sign because we're encoding direction. Don't forget with a stepper you've got forwards and backwards. <laughs> uh, so again, that's, um, as we said before, that's uh, eight bits, I think I said. One, the MSB would be the sign or direction and the, um, the other seven bits will be how many steps so up to 127 steps in this section is part of the move and the final one i think was um how much we change the step whether it's acceleration deceleration so again it will be kind of signed uh, should we make that eight as well? That might not need to be eight finally. Oh, I'm being a twat. Hold on. Let's get this right. There's an easy way of defining this. Although this may not be the best way of doing it. Shaping it as they refer to it. No, not Z. Uh, true. So we're saying signed is true here as part of the shape. Uh, oh, God. Um, We're going to need that again down here. So steps and change. We, this is acceleration and deceleration. Change a good word for this. I guess it's as good as any other at this point. I think that's those. What else might we need? So these are effectively external. So this 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 is the signal coming in. 
So when the spy part of their MyGen spy module is ready, has uh, has the bytes ready, it will send the signal high, um, and then we can read in the start signal steps and the change, and then we can process that move. When we finish that move, we send the ready signal high back. To let it uh, let the stepper controller know, sorry, the spy to know that we're ready for the next bite. So this is kind of our handshake, the move and ready. Um, then we're going to need some internal ones. What we're going to need? Well, we're going to need a stepper motor. Um, Can you carry it away with me, please? Those shouldn't be caps. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. Um, Oh, what am I doing? Uh, that's going to be an instance of uh, stepper motor. So we're going to use the class that we've already got, the module that we've already got called stepper motor that we've imported here. Um, the other thing we're going to need is a bunch of internal signals. I think we should um, synchronize the incoming signal. Uh, move because we need we also need to know when there's an edge on that um, so let's create that so it's going to need to be a two bit um, signal um, so we're going to use the old um, shift register type trick to synchronize the incoming move signal. Then we'll have two bits. So we'll see what it currently is and what its last state was. So we need a positive and negative edge. Let's just, um, let's be a way of including this normally. because I'm sure I've got this in the other file. Okay. I wonder if I've pulled in Are they in the stepper file? Was it G E? Yeah. And an E. So I can reuse these. Shouldn't really be in the stepper file. Probably a better place to have these primitives. We need those positive edge and negative edge. These are predefined as 0, 1 and 1, 0. It's a change in this two bit signal as we're shifting it in. I'll remind you of that in a minute when I do it. What else are we going to need? Right, I'm going to come back to this in a minute. We're going to need, going to need to know what step we're on as we go through. That's obvious. So. I see, you see, that's an 8 bit. It's actually 7 bit, isn't it? Thinking about it. Seven, yeah, because we, we're counting as we go through. 
no, yes. Current step. Is that what I'm talking about here? Number of steps, 1 to 27. So, yeah, that needs to be... 7 bits, not 8. Um, oh, the current delay as we're going through between steps, that's going to change as we go through. Uh, that should be, should that be, I'm being 8 bit, I think. Um, what else might we need? Might need to come back to this in a minute. Let's uh, start writing the um. We should have a ports method. Hmm. Something like this. Um, so what we're going to have here, we're going to have all of these we're gonna have move hold on we want more we want ready start We're filling up the screen here. Gonna have to um just, just make that a little smaller. I don't want to say off dot um what don't we have? Oh um delay. And then uh, what we're going to need is the um, we're going to need this. Air elaborate wall. Uh, and then we're going to need a module, that's fairly obvious. Maybe. Uh, 
Um, hold on. Clock boilerplate. Um, dot setup module. Um, step a controller. Self. Um, we're going to want a counter as well. Would be my guess. Let's have a counter. I don't know how many bits we're going to need this. I'll come back to that in a minute. What am I talking about? Self dot stepper motor. Okay, let's synchronize the um, incoming move. Sync. Um, oh, I need plus equals. Uh, one of these here. This is where we synchronize the um, incoming move. What we're doing here is the move. Synchronize move. Um, and that's just move. So we're synchronizing that. Um, See what I'm complaining about here. Our list, um, it's typed, isn't it? Let's forget this. Um, oops. Mm -hmm. Complaining about that. There. Right. Um, try to synchronize the incoming signal. So 
think about the default state then whew, then we're going to need some sort of case switch um, Uh, Laurie's saying uh, easier to import star and change it later when you know what you're using. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. But I was so badly um, injured from that previous thing, previous set of code reviews. Um, Uh, so what am I going to do here? I'm going to do um, some brackets. This is what I'm going to do. I just need to set the default state of dot um, ready. Oh, I need that to equal false. Oh, why did it do that? <laughs> um. My step signal should also be false. Thinking about it. So I'm going to need to do. Did I call it stepper motor? Step. Um, would I need to set direction? Is there a default for direction? Probably not at this point. I'd have to think about that. Uh, I need to pick off direction. I'm going to have to assume that that, that is stable. I assume that's latched. I'll come back to that in a minute. All right, so I need to think about let's use a state machine instead of cases. I'm gonna need oh, what states idle? Well, it's not doing anything, so that to start with. Hold on, crikey. So, yeah, if you haven't seen this, uh, let me think, FSM. This is great little in my gen feature, actually. Uh, what's dates? So, we have, this is the structure that it looks like. L M dot uh, state in it. Yes. And then in here you just use like a, a constant string. Um, oh. So uh, for instance. 
that'll be one section and then there'll be another one well let's just put a pass in there for now we can fill these in after um then we're gonna have the next one which is gonna be uh what's the next date gonna need a step state where it's actually doing the step stuff right <clears throat> you need a finish date oh hold on think remember we're drawing um, step and then there's delay and there's a step so there's actually two parts to the step because we're creating the step function so we've got to spend to create the step function we need the step itself must be at least a clock long it may need to be longer let's just make it a clock long for a minute so we need just a a kind of dummy state in between really I suppose and uh, like a hold on no I want it after step don't I so we send it high and then we hold it high for one cycle uh, um, Um, wait that will do right so in the idle state we're doing nothing right so So we need an if. We need to check. So we're sitting around and we're waiting for the ready signal, aren't we? If. Oh, what am I talking about? Don't win in my gen. We want. Um, we're looking at if we're looking for the positive edge of the move signal, signal from move. So we're looking for so off dot move synchronized. And we want that to be equal to positive edge, which we've imported from the stepper. And if that's the case, then we've received, or there's a, some step information ready for us. So we should get that. We should load that. Ah, uh, sync. Sorry for my type, slow typing, guys. It's, um, I've got 
got to get my head around this keyboard. Here we use plus equals. Um, how are we doing for time? Yeah, I'm not going to do much more. Do a bit more on this um, Pirate State machine and then um, record it quits. So MD dot sync dot um, let's open our brackets here. We're going to need to load in the step, aren't we? Yes, we're going to load in. So we're going to set. step and that's going to be equal we're only interested in the seven bit of the steps self dot uh, steps in it no stepper what? Oh, I'm oh, being a. No, it steps. Yeah, steps. But we only want. So we need to use a slice. We just want the. Um, Everything other than uh, the MSB. Because the MSB is the direction which we need to set on the stepper motor. Register. So that's not going to change. Denial. Oh. Um, so this is the other way around. See, MSB, we want not the rest of it. I know this is all a bit arse about face in Python compared to um, Verilog. Takes some getting used to. Does my head in. Oh, and we need a comma in between two of these because they're actually part of the list. So we're. Um, Getting the steps, number of steps we've got to move. So we're setting that up in our local step register because we're going to count down through, through those steps to complete the move. And we're also setting the direction on the motor. So any movements that we send to that motor, the direction uh, needs to be applicable. I'm assuming... Because the assumption is at this point the last move has happened, right? So I can say I should safely be able to set the motor direction without messing with it. And in, internally, anyhow, the stepper motor resynchronizes the DIR signal, so that won't won't be changing. We won't be manipulating the register directly. Um, I know we need the delay signal. I haven't defined the signal that we have to wait for the amount that we have to wait for. Because we need to set the weight now. Some of this naming isn't brilliant. The confusion between uh, Between weight and delay is a bit confusing here. Might need to rename these in a bit. 
Oh. Is it eight? I guess it can be up to eight. Oh, crazy. Sorry, guys. Uh, yeah, we need to set that to its initial value, right? We get that from the delay. Uh, yeah. Oh, what am I talking about? It's the initial value, right? It's the start. Start value. So this is the start value between the steps, the start speed, or reciprocal speed. So we're setting that up. So we're preparing the step. I think. Um, and we also need to set the state that we're going to go to next after having done that. So. Crikey, what is it? M, M dot next. So the next state we're going to go to is actually starting the um, the uh, step state itself. Right, now let's quickly do the uh, step state, what we're doing here. Uh, M dot, oh, the Think mm, I think I was, yeah, I'm gonna need several things here to make a list. What are we gonna do first? Let's set the self let's set the step signal high. No. Alright. Oh. Keep doing that. True. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna take our step signal high because we're sending a step. And We need to know how long to wait for. So we need to update this by the increment. If it's zero, it's no change. If it's one, then it'll be larger. If it's minus, it'll be less. So that will be acceleration or deceleration or the other way around, actually. So we should update that. Wish there was an easier way to do updates rather than this long-winded verbose way. Python. Um, 
plus the delay because the delay is how much it changes each time. No, the change, isn't it? That we want change is how much it changes each time, which could be zero, zero if we're wrong. Self dot change. So if it's constant speed, that will be zero. So weight will stay the same. If we're accelerating, the distance between the steps, time between the steps will be going down. So that would be negative. So we're adding, adding a negative amount because this is signed arithmetic. Two complements, two complements arithmetic. Uh, and if we're decelerating, the weight value will go up, i.e. the distance of time we wait between the um, start of the step and the end of this step. Okay. Um, okay. So we're going to wait a delay. Do we want to reset the delay or do we want to count the delay down? We can go either way. Let's let's just count delay up from zero. same thing I will get used to this keyboard eventually it's the position of my fingers it's a bit awkward uh, what's this gonna be it's gonna be zero I need to write that in a bit better way in a minute let's come back that's just a, that's not going to accept that but that will do for the moment oh, our next state what's our next state gonna be we're gonna go into the weight the delay state so uh, m dot next is um, this one here okay and then when we're in the weight state what we're gonna do is we need an if because we're going to be looking at the delay. Uh, no, what am I doing? And my gen doesn't work that way with uh, m dot if. That's all. What we need if um, so delay is equal to right. Hmm. Then we've reached the um, timeout. So we change. So we go back to the
next step mode remember also um, we don't need to do anything with the step signal because we're setting the step signal to false every time round here so that will only be overridden here otherwise it will always be false that's why I did that initially it's default behavior Ah, I'm doing that as a function. It's not a function, is it? Hmm. Oh, come on. I also need to do the else with because I need to increment the delay if that's not the case um, else don't have any condition in there um, was before plus one so we're counting up oops I think I'm just worried about formatting here. I think there should be a space maybe between these. So it goes back. That's not no, the next isn't way to step. I've right done. Sorry if I was not paying attention. So how do we know when we've done that? We need to be decrementing um, the steps, don't we? Step needs to be decrementing in here, I think. Every time we go in here, we should uh, decrement step, right? The local step, I mean. Uh. 
Joe are counting the steps down after having set it here. Because if the step is equal to zero, so all of this should be in the if, shouldn't it? So Oh, what am I doing? Typo city area zero now. If a step uh, what is it? Step is equal to zero then that means we've counted down so we want to um, go to the done step don't we else we do the other stuff and then we just need to um Why isn't that? Ooh, that's a funniness with my keyboard. Mm. Okay. Done. Oh. We get it done. So if it's, if our steps have stepped down to zero, then we're done. What do we do when we're done? We've got to send a signal saying we're ready, haven't we? We've just got to be at least one pulse wide. Oh, and then I think we're pretty much there. South dot ready. Uh, equals should be called true now, right? Is that right? Oh, my thinking. It's got to be one of these. I do get confused sometimes with this. I'm still not used to it. It must be in a MD.sync sequential section. So I'll put equals true. And otherwise it should equal false. Is it always equaling false here? Yes. Oh, I forgot the comma there. Voila, that kind of works. I think I may have forgotten a few things I need to have a think about. Oh, better do the next um, state. Oh, mustn't forget that. Must state machine. So we want to go back to the uh, to this idle. So we're ready to receive the next one. I think I'll leave it at that. Um, 
So I need to check through all of that, but that's kind of roughly the state machine. Um, and then at the end, we need to return them. Um, the module, don't we, if I remember rightly? But we we're going to need to do some more things in here as well. But that 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 sets up roughly. We haven't used the counter yet either. Um, I don't know if we need that. Man, let's get rid of that. It's just confusing. That. Let's leave it there. It's a good place to end, I think. Looks okay-ish. I need to. We'll probably need to um, do some simulation as well next time. Anyhow, I'm clean out of time. I've been streaming for nearly three hours. I'm surprised anyone's still left after that rather slow, um, slow work. I do apologise. As I say, I'm getting used to this really new compact Colima keyboard, and it's I just haven't got the pa pattern the um, muscle memory <laughs> yet, and it's odd. But I've just got to keep at it. But anyhow, thanks for joining me, guys. Um, I'll be streaming again next Wednesday. Come find me down at the forum if you need to, or speak to anyone else down there about these conversations that we have. Um, I've got to get on with some CAD this week. I'm probably not going to do much in the way of code because um, I desperately need to get that CAD done to see if I can meet this deadline for next week to get this PCB order in. If I do, I'll let you know next week. If not, I'll still be working on it. But thank you for joining me once again. Uh, have a good week. And uh, if you've got any questions, fire them away down at the forum, etc. Look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, guys.